The shopping cart is the ultimate litmus test for whether a person is capable of self-governing. To return the shopping cart is an easy, convenient task, and one which we all recognise is the correct, appropriate thing to do. To return the shopping cart is objectively right. There are no situations other than dire emergencies in which a person is not able to return their cart. Simultaneously, it is not illegal to abandon your shopping cart. Therefore, the shopping cart presents itself as the apex example of whether a person will do what is right without being forced to do it. No one will punish you for not returning the shopping cart. No one will fine you or kill you for not returning the shopping cart. You gain nothing by returning the shopping cart. A person who is unable to do this is no better than an animal, an absolute savage who can only be made to do what is right by threatening them with a law and the force that stands behind it. The shopping cart is what determines whether a person is a good or bad member of society. That post about shopping trolleys was very popular for a while and it got shared around a lot. And although I agree with the spirit of it broadly, I think there's so much more to say about what it means to act ethically in a system, um, in a shared space with other people who are also making the same ethical decision as you are. And I want to get into talking a little bit about uh, The Selfish Gene by Richard Dawkins and discussing the prisoner's dilemma and what he calls uh, reciprocal altruism. Reciprocal altruism is when you act in a way that benefits others at a cost to yourself. That's the altruism part. But the reciprocal part is that there's also an expectation that someone else will do the same thing for you when you need it. His example is of birds who extract parasites from each other's heads. If a bird has a parasite on the top of its head, he cannot reach it with his own beak and he will die from it if another bird doesn't help him get it out. Helping the afflicted bird does not directly benefit anyone and it incurs a small cost because it takes time and energy which could otherwise be spent on building a nest or finding food or nurturing hatchlings. This is the prisoner's dilemma which is a simple game very often used in game theory to understand the nature of cooperation. In humans, we have the benefit of recognising each other and forming an enduring opinion of someone based on their past experience. So we can trust each other and cooperate, up until the point when someone betrays us and does not reciprocate our goodwill. This is an ethical system of justice that Dawkins and others claim is written into our very genes. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. As humans, we have an even higher level of playing this game so that we can cooperate with people who you've never met and who we will never meet again. Returning your trolley is certainly altruistic, but usually what's happening is that you're participating in a system of trolley returning behaviour in exchange for the benefit of parking your car in a car park that's not littered with trolleys. You live in a culture of reciprocal altruism that benefits everyone, and the trolley is just one example. When you're out in public, there are probably hundreds of things you're doing to avoid inconveniencing others without even thinking about it. It's so habitual for most people that the only time you're conscious of it is when someone else is failing to do it. You might notice it if you see litter on the ground, or worse. Or when you're behind someone in a queue and they're taking too long to order because they're being indecisive. Or when someone's talking loudly in a theatre. There are lots of things you can do that are beneficial to yourself that are very disruptive to everyone else in the immediate area. If everyone did all these things all the time, life would be much less pleasant and some facilities that we take for granted wouldn't even be able to exist. If everyone in the theatre is talking as much as they'd like, as loudly as they'd like, nobody is going to be able to pay attention to what they've all come there to see. Coming back to the trolley example, many supermarkets have already seen the system of reciprocal altruism break down. They have to enforce trolley returning behaviour by forcing you to insert a coin into the trolley when you take it, and risk losing the coin if you don't return the trolley. People who shop in these supermarkets with this enforcement now have the small inconvenience of having to bring a coin with them, or buying one of those coin-shaped key rings you can get to trick the trolley. <laughs> On the more extreme end of the decline of moral standards is an anecdote that I heard from Peter Hitchens from when he was living in Soviet-era Moscow. He said the residents living there could not even leave their windscreen wipers unguarded because they'd be stolen. So their solution was to store the wiper blades inside their car 
And then when it started to rain, they would stop the car, get out the blades, and fix them to the windscreen. On a mass scale, this meant that when it started to rain in Moscow, traffic would completely stop and everyone put their wiper blades on. The really pernicious thing about this system is that the, it only takes a few cars stopping to hold up the flow of traffic. So if even a small percentage of people start doing this, you might as well participate in it yourself because you're going to have to stop your car either way. Our culture of reciprocal altruism is much more fragile than many people realise. And 99% of it is completely invisible, even to the people who are contributing to upholding it. Once a certain tipping point is reached, there may be no coming back from it. It could be that no amount of goodwill and altruism will bring back the high trust cooperative behaviour that was lost. In the parable about all the hungry people sitting around a table with long spoons, they can't feed themselves because their spoons are too long, but they can use their spoon to feed someone else and hope that someone will feed them in return. When everyone around the table is too selfish and self-absorbed to try feeding anyone else and they're just vainly trying to feed themselves with their huge spoon, this is called hell. And when everyone around the table is feeding each other, that's heaven. These two opposite outcomes could result from the pe table being either populated by completely ethical people or completely populated by unethical people. But I think you could get the same two outcomes, opposite ends of the spectrum, just by populating the table with the same group of people under different circumstances. People usually act ethically if they are raised in a system where that's what everyone else is doing and that's what is expected of them. In a way, it's not truly altruistic at all, since everyone is only acting out of habit or serving an altruistic instinct that has evolved in human psychology, or else just protecting their own reputation. The truest test of personal ethics, in my opinion, is how you act when no one will find out what you've done, or when you know you'll be maligned for doing the right thing. But that's going off topic and might be a video for another time. As it is, I hope you found this video interesting, and I really recommend reading The Selfish Gene. I know a lot of people think that Richard Dawkins is a little, a little bit um, cringe uh, 2005 atheist, but this book is um, it's really essential for understanding uh, human psychology, in my opinion, and it's full of lots of very interesting things about animals. Just a brilliant book. I've talked about it before. Thank you very much for watching. I look forward to reading your comments under the video. Uh, have a good day and I will see you again soon.